So with, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you guys to hit that start the presentation. All right. All right, so I'm Joseph. These are no, Noah, yes, and Grant. All right, so we're gonna start off with the timeline of the depressed cubic. The depressed cubic was first solved by a man named Scipion Del Ferro, and I will probably botch plenty of names today. Uh, Del Ferro, he kept the solution secret because back then they had these rigorous math competitions and if you lost one, you would likely lose your job at the university and you'd be disgraced. So he kept it in his back pocket just in case. He never needed to use it. So at the end of his life, he passed it on to Antonio Fiore, who instantly said, I'm gonna go ruin some man's whole career. <laughs> he, he challenged Niccolo Fontana, AKA Tartaglia, which means the stammerer. Uh, he submitted 30 depressed cubic problems. And he figured, I might not get much from Tartaglia's problems, but he ain't gonna get any of mine. And that'll be even worse than my poor performance. However, Tartaglia discovered the solution in the last moment and he got every single problem correct. So it was a 30 to 12, just squashing. So uh, Fiora went away, he was completely disgraced. And Tartaglia only shared the solution with Girolamo Cardano, and Cardano vowed not to publish the solution under any circumstances. Cardano, likewise, only shared the solution with his protege, Ludovico Ferrari. Not much is given about him, except that they knew each other from, uh, Cardano knew Ferrari from a young age. The two came, however, in a trip to Bologna. Yes, they traveled to a place called Bologna, and they found a document in Del Ferro's own hand where he had written the depressed cubic solution. So Cardano said, hey, I didn't get this from Tartaglia. I got it from Del Ferro. Therefore, I can publish it. He gave credit as much as he thought was due to, Tart to Tartaglia. Uh, he did not take it well. He was very unhappy about it. And they uh, had some fiery exchanges with plenty of puns. <laughs> Anyway, who is Girolamo Cardano? Most of what we know from his life is uh, from the book De Vita Propria Liber, meaning the book of my life. Cardano was literally torn from his mother's womb, an ancient C-section, and a bath of warm wine was needed to save his life, and many people probably considered him illegitimate. He was constantly sick as a child. He goes into very great detail about that. We will not. It was a lot. When he wasn't sick, he decided to hurt himself just to feel the relief of when the pain ended. He was sick physically and mentally. And fittingly enough, he studied medicine at the University of Padua, but was refused the right to practice medicine in his hometown. I don't know why. The book never specified. So he moved to Sacco. One night, he had a dream of a beautiful woman clothed in white, and sometime later, he saw a woman exactly matching his dream. It was one of those, oh no, no, she's too good for me, but I can't help myself. So he wound up marrying Lucia Bandarini, the woman of his dreams. <laughs> that was the book's pun, not mine. Cardano then managed to gamble his way to poverty only to inexplicably start giving lectures and writing successful treatises, which eventually led the College of Physicians to accept him. From there, he became the most famous and sought after doctor in Europe. He even attended to the Pope. However, personal tragedies ended his, uh, his glory days. His wife died early. His oldest son was executed for murdering his wife, who was accurately described as a wild woman. And his other son also became a criminal, so great family. He had a daughter, and uh, it's likely that she just got married and then completely forgotten. There's no other mention of her. He did, however, raise his grandson uh, as he accepted a job at the University of Bologna, but uh, he was arrested for heresy because the church in Italy did not like the Reformation, nor did they like it when he wrote a book called In Praise of Nero, but that's, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was released with the help of his friend's testimonials, though, 
and uh, he just decided to move to Rome and somehow, some way, he managed to get a pension from the Pope. Yep, the book, the book just says, oh, he somehow got it. So, yeah. And he spent his last days in peace, a very eventful life, as you see. Somewhere in here, the depressed cubic took place. It is not at all stated when. It could be in his days of peace. It could be in his days of fame. It never specifies. So, what is the depressed cubic? Well, that's what Noah's going to tell you. So, Cardano's formula for solving the depressed cubic. Um, so, the depressed cubic is that cubic right there has the form x cubed plus mx equals n. Um, so that's what we tried to solve. So he stated the rule as this lengthy paragraph here. Um, not much simpler, even in just doing modern algebra. Um, but you'll notice there is a lot of repetition in it. Um, these two terms are very similar. The only difference between them is that negative sign there. Um, so if you're trying to do it, it's not too bad because there's a lot of repetition and symmetry in it. Um, all right. Let's move on to how he proved it. So to start, we're going to um, take t minus u and cube it. Um, so we're going to expand that out al algebraically to get t cubed minus 3u t squared plus 3u squared t minus u cubed. Um, then what we're going to do, we're going to take these middle two terms here, and we're going to move them over to the other side of the equation. Um, that's what the next line there is. So once we've done that, um, you'll notice that both of these terms have 3ut in them. So we're going to factor that out and get 3ut times t minus u. Um, so this equation is the important one there. Um, Cardano didn't actually use um, algebra like this to derive that equation because he didn't have algebra. Um, so he actually used cubes, uh, literal geometric cubes, to figure this out. Um, so he kind of <laughs> took a large cube and divided it into six different sections to get this equation. So that's kind of what the pictures there illustrate how he did that. Um, so taking a look at that equation there, um, if we make the substitution u equals t minus u, um, we'll get this last equation down here, which is a depressed cubic. So we've got the x cubed plus something times x equals something x. Um, so we're on kind of on the right track there. Let's see where this is starting to go. So um, remember our original equation was x cubed plus mx equals n. Um, so we're going to set m equal to 3ut, and n is t cubed minus u. Um, with the based on forms that top equation there. Um, so now we know what m and m are for given the equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and solve for u and t in terms of m and n. So we've got two equations, two unknowns. So we should be able to do this, hopefully. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to get u in terms of t. So if we divide that first part there, um, by both divide both sides by 3t, we get that u is equal to m over 3t. Um, we can cube that to get u cubed is m cubed over 27 um, t cubed. And when we know u cubed, we can substitute that into that second equation there. Uh, we'll get t cubed, we'll get yeah, this equation here, t cubed minus m cubed over 27 t cubed equals m. Um, so from that, we're going to multiply the entire equation through by t cubed. Um, so we'll get t to the 6 minus n t cubed minus n cubed over 27 equals 0. Um, so notice we also moved this n here to the other side of the equation. Um, so we look a little closer at this equation. Um, it, it seems more complicated. We've now got term involving you know, t to the 6, t cubed. Um, but it's actually just a quadratic equation. We think about t cubed as 
uh, single variable. So it's really kind of just like y squared, like about t cubed is y, um, y squared minus and y minus m cubed over 27 equals zero. Um, so we can actually use the quadratic formula to solve for t cubed here. Um, so if we do that, there's algebra you can do there. Uh, but we can solve for t cubed. That's just algebra to do there. Um, once we know t cubed, we can take the cube root of both sides to get t. Uh, once we know t, we can substitute it back into our original equations and figure out what u is. Um, so I skipped over most of that algebra there. It's fairly simple, it's just busy work for the most part. Uh, but once we know t and u, remember we did our original substitution as x equals t minus u. So we can figure out what x is then, so we t minus u. Um, and that's how we get the final equation right on this formula. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, wait, why wouldn't it be plus or minus? Oh, I'm just kidding, it's cubed. Yeah, the cube root. Um, why is it called the depressed cubic? So it's called the depressed cubic because it doesn't have a y squared term in it. It's just an x cubed term, an x term, a constant. So the y squared has been removed. I don't know why they chose the name pressed, but yeah. All right, that's the end of proof. So yes, this uh, formula is for the depressed cubic, um, which doesn't have that x squared term, but obviously we'd love to be able to solve any cubic. So um, the way that he gets to be able to solve any cubic is he makes a substitution and then reduces a regular cubic down to a depressed cubic. And then once he's done that, then he knows how to solve it. So how he figured it out, I don't know. But if you substitute x equals y minus b over 3a, then you can reduce it. So if we're just using the symbols here, this would be the uh, standard cubic that we would start with. And then if we make that substitution, we get this thing here and then you can expand it out and it gets kind of messy. But the important thing to notice is those two highlighted terms are the only terms with y squared. And so those cancel out. And then what we have is a cubic in terms of y, but it does not have y squared, which means it's a depressed cubic. Um, and so then if we solve it using his method as a depressed cubic, then we solve for y, and then using our substitution, once we know what y is, then we can solve for x. So uh, an example of that here. So if we wanted to solve this cubic, then we say x is equal to y minus b over 3a, which simplifies to x is y plus 5. And so then if we do that, we substitute it in, and we're left with this cubic here. Um, and if you were to put that into Cardano's formula, then you get y equals 2. And then if y is, is 2, x must be 2 plus 5, which is 7. So that's how he solves the cubic is getting it down to the depressed cubic that he knows how to solve already. Um, so he had solved the cubic. Um, he did it in some weird ways because he couldn't comprehend negative numbers for some reason. And part of the reason for that is because he didn't use algebra the way we did. He used those physical cubes and you can't have cubes with negative lengths. And so in his book, he actually considered each case separately. So for him, if he had everything but that D, uh, everything on the left side except for D was on the right side, that was different to him then if the x squared term was on the left and everything else was on the right. Um, and so he ended up having to spend 13 chapters on what we could have done in one formula, and we do in one formula, but um, he got the job done eventually. Um, so think about it then though, if he was that worried about negative numbers, what would he think of the square roots of negative numbers? Those were just crazy to him. 
Um, and so as in the quadratic formula, you in the solving the cubic T, you sometimes run across um, imaginary numbers. And he tried to think about what that would be. And he just kind of gave up because it's too hard. Um, but it's a little different here. In quadratics, if you, you either have two real solutions or you have two imaginary solutions. And if your solutions are imaginary, it's pretty easy to say, well, they just don't exist and we can ignore them. But what happens in cubic sometimes is you have a cubic with three real solutions, but when you're using his formula, you end up having to use imaginary numbers to get there. Um, so Raphael Bombelli suggested that imaginary numbers are the vehicle to get from a real cubic equation to the real solutions. And so this is why this was the first time that mathematicians were really forced to consider um, the complex numbers because they, they couldn't avoid them anymore. Um, so as an example of that, uh, if you want to solve this cubic x cubed minus 15x equals 4, um, you'd use Cardano's equation and you'd get this mess here, which has the imaginary number as a square root of negative 121. Um, some mathematician somehow figured out that the cube root of this complex number is equal to this complex number. Um, I don't know how they did that, but they did. Um, and then if you do that, then you plug it in and you see that the two imaginary numbers will end up canceling out. And then you're just left with four, which is a very real solution, but we could not have gotten there without having to use imaginary numbers. So eventually, Leonard Euler was the first one to, to really find better methods for finding these imaginary roots, because if you can't do that, then you can't solve some cubics like this. Um, so the other thing people did is they said, wow, Cardano basically reduced a cubic down to a quadratic, which we can already solve. So what if we wanted to solve a quartic equation, which has an x to the fourth term? Uh, maybe we could, and that's a typo there too. Um, that should be cubics. So maybe we could reduce a quartic equation down to a cubic, which now we know how to solve, and then we could solve quartics. And it turns out you can do that, and you make the substitution x equals y minus b over 4a, and that reduces a quartic equation down to a cubic. Um, so you should notice a pattern when we were reducing a cubic to a quartic, um, this was a three. And now to reduce the quartic, it's a four. And so the next logical step is if we wanted to reduce a quintic down to a quartic and then down to a cubic, maybe we could do the substitution y minus b over 5a. And so we tried that and it turns out it does not work. And that just seems strange to people. They tried a ton of different things. And then eventually Niels Abel actually proved that you cannot uh, solve a quintic this way. Um, the solutions to a quintic equation are algebraic, but we can't come up with a formula for it based on the coefficients of the equation like we can for a cubic and a quartic. So that's one of the strange things algebra can do a lot, but it is limited in what it can do. Yes, I have a question. Yes. So you don't, you don't really mean that a quartic can be reduced to a cubic. Because even in the case of a cubic, you weren't reducing a cubic to a quadratic. Well, I guess you were reducing it well, to a quadratic dimension. Yeah, so. Because it was a t to the sixth. Yes, OK, I see what you mean. Yeah, so you, you get to the t to the sixth. I mean, it, it, looks, it doesn't look like a quadratic. But so you depress it somehow. And then in the depression process, it becomes yep, in the depression one smaller. In the depression process, you get down to where you use the quadratic formula a couple times. And then that becomes, there's a lot of substitutions too. But, so the, the idea is when you make that substitution, you get down to some things and other variables that ends up being a cubic. So that's supposed to be cubics, right? Cubic can be reduced to cubics. Yes. Okay, I, I had one other question. You said at some point, why would you think to put y, x equal to y minus b over 3a? Well, they had the quadratic formula, right? Yeah. 
And uh, what did that involve? What does the quadratic formula involve? It's like B over something makes two a common a. appearance in multiple places. It was B over yeah. two A. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I mean, so all over two A. So negative B over two A makes a prominent appearance. And it turns out that the substitution X equal to Y minus B over two A is kind of the substitution that you make yeah, and it's essentially kind of a an old school way of completing the square. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it probably would have occurred to Cardano fairly quickly that, well, although he stole this from Tartaglia apparently, yeah. right? That the substitution x equal to y minus b over three a should do the job. Yeah. So yeah. that part he didn't. He came up with turning a general cubic equation into the test one. Okay. He only got the solution for the prep specific from. Okay, so he did come up with that substitution on his own. Okay, well, yeah. that's fairly yeah. impressive. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, Cardano would tell you that he, yeah, he got it originally from Tricotia, but eventually he got it from Del Ferro, therefore, because yeah, yeah. of yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Continue, sir. Uh, well, that actually is the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey. All right. So, there's any other questions? This is really off topic. I don't know if you want to do it. Was it too late? I don't know. The, okay. the thing I'd be thinking about shapes in the third dimension. And then I was like, what's a shape in the fourth dimension? Oh, uh, well, that's what Flatland is kind of about, sort of. <laughs> so that's a uh, right, four dimensional or higher dimensional shapes. Uh, that's kind of what, what Flatland starts getting you thinking about. So if you're excited to talk about that, go read Flatland for sure. Yeah. Yes. Doesn't the fourth dimension the most amount of regular solid codes of any dimension? Uh, and six and every other well other than the second dimension. Yeah, well maybe. Yeah. I mean, so in Flatland it's, it, it tries to give you an idea of what's going on to, to move from one dimension to the next. So if you were to go into the fourth dimension, uh, you would imagine doing something like maybe with cubes to try to advance into whatever the fourth dimension is. But the issue is we don't live in a higher dimension to where we can actually see what's what's happening rigorously. We only see like a slice of what's happening in the three dimensional space. But there's actually a movie called Flatland uh, where they kind of get into that. And, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, any other questions for these guys? Yeah. yeah. Isn't the formula for the core take like really, really long? Yeah, even the because the, the formula we showed for the the cubic is only for the depressed cubic. Right. So there's one for the actual cubic, but it's like, I think it would fill the whole slide. It's, it's really gnarly. The, the yeah. cortic would probably be ginormous. Yeah. There, yeah. Is, there is a form of the quintic, which does work sometimes. It's when you get x to the fifth equals some number. And, you know, sometimes that works like if you can pull that through. Yeah, if you can find it, it's not always a nice even number. Why? Uh, I think they may have remarked about this at the end of the chapter. Why is the why is the quintic and beyond not solvable? Like, so so like we have formulas. I mean, to solve a linear equation is trivial. Right. Anybody, any ninth grader can do that, right? Uh, the quadratic formula, if you have enough sophistication, you can almost come up with it on your own, right? You just know a little bit of algebra. The cubic's a little bit harder, the quartic's a little bit harder. But then what, what is going on with five and above that prevents there from being like a general formula that works? Um, I don't know exactly. I, what I do remember the book saying is the furthest people got with the quintic is they got down to, um, they could get down to that. They couldn't get any further. I don't know exactly why. <laughs> but So it has to do, I didn't know if they said this in the chapter or not, but it has to do with con uh, something called constructability, <laughs> which is what the Greeks were massively obsessed with, right? Like what sorts of things, what kind of links could I construct with compass and straight edge? And it turns out that constructability is somehow connected 
to solutions to the quintic and above. <laughs> it's not obvious why that would be the case at all. But it turns out that, uh, that constructability prevents such an equation from happening for, for degree five and above. Huh. Um, yeah, I didn't mention that. Dr. Hey, Dr. Fry will talk about that in, in abstract algebra. Yeah. They mentioned you can solve quintics by things called elliptic functions, and a brief look at the Wikipedia page for that showed that we won't be learning that anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, elliptic curves are what Andrew Biles used to solve for Moss last there, but yeah. yeah. We'll watch a movie about that eventually. All right, other questions? I was going to read a little uh, excerpt, sort of interesting. All right, so a couple things. So first of all, Tartaglia. Why, why did they call him Tartaglia? It says he the stammer. An injury as a child because of a soldier from another nation. Yeah, a soldier kind of slashed through his face, and apparently uh, he had a pretty gnarly cut in his face that caused him to talk in sort of a strange way. So. Tartaglia literally means stammer in Italian, okay? Apparently. Uh, but here is, the, here is the oath that Cardano was sworn to by Tartaglia. Because remember, Tartaglia shared the solution to the depressed cubic with Cardano, yeah? He said, this is, this, this is the oath Cardano took. I swear to you by the sacred gospel and on my faith as a gentleman, not only never to publish your discoveries, if you tell them to me, but I also promise and pledge my faith as a true Christian to put them down in cipher so that after my death, no one shall be able to understand them. <laughs> uh, there was also, uh, there, he had a lot of problems with his body. Um, I feel like there was a, passage in here that was kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was that? Oh, oh man, yeah. In his autobiography, Cardano never hesitated to describe his afflictions, often in complete, if not disgusting detail. He told of violent heart palpitations, of fluids oozing from the stomach and chest, of ruptures and hemorrhoids, not to mention a disease characterized by, quote, this is from his diary, sorry, an extraordinary discharge of urine, yielding up to 100 ounces, nearly a gallon per day. He recorded intense fear of high places, as well as, quote, of places where there is any report of mad dogs having been seen, end quote. Uh, and other things. Uh, so he was sort of an interesting guy for sure, um, but clearly also a genius. So, so there you go. Madness and genius married into the same individual, which seems to happen with fair frequency sometimes. Okay. Well, any other questions for these guys? All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, uh, who's next, by the way? You are? Okay. And what, what you guys are doing? Newton? Okay, so they're doing Newton's chapter seven, uh, and it's the approximation of pi or something, right? Is that what it is? <laughs> I think that's what it was. So, I mean, you guys know that Archimedes gave an approximation of pi, right? When did that take place? I mean, just on the historical timeline? A long time ago? So, I mean, he, uh, yeah, so Archimedes would have been like third century BC, basically, okay? Third century BC. Uh, what we just heard about, Cardano, oh, and by the way, Heron would have been probably less than 100 years after Archimedes, yes? So we were still in the BCs, you know what I'm saying? We just skipped ahead like a lot of years. 
like probably about 1600 years, for instance, uh, actually there was a fair, a, a fair amount of inactivity as it pertains to mathematics for, uh, for those like 1600 or so years. Um, you know, the Arabs actually did a fair amount, but that was like an era of conquest after conquest after conquest by nation after nation after nation. And it just seems like what happened was this one nation would basically steal what the other nation had done and they would kind of keep it and then, the, and then they would get taken over by someone else and then that, that information would pass along. I mean, sometimes that's referred to as, you know, part of that is referred to as the dark ages, if you will, right? Um, so nothing really happens mathematically for a lot of years. And it's not until uh, really the 16th century that stuff starts happening again, 15th and 16th centuries. Yes, Monique, do you have a question? Oh, okay. What was that? What was, what was the, oh. Right, yeah, that was just the era of, of conquest. Um, so it just really seems like that, that really prevented a lot of intellectual discovery from taking place. But now there's gonna be a fair amount of discovery that happens over the next few hundred years. And Isaac Newton is just whoop. It's not just mathematics, it's uh, you know physics and, and everything else. And he actually apparently discovered the calculus too, uh, which, which is kind of important, right? All right, so any other questions? Yeah, Zach Davis, okay, Zach makes a joke. It sounds like he was a depressed cubit, okay? So, good one. Yep. <laughs> yeah, good one. That's right. Utterly despondent, yeah. He's good at puns. I've actually seen William Dunham, who wrote this book, I've seen him give talks before, and he does a really good job. Uh, and he makes lots of math puns, which is always a good thing. So, yeah. But nobody liked my math pun joke about zero and eight. Um, okay. Yeah, that's right. Just say, okay, just so you have a good math joke, why, you know, what did zero say to eight? Nice belt. Right, so just kind of keep that in mind. Don't forget it. If you don't get anything else from this class, that's a good thing to take, take to the bank, okay? All right, anything else? All right, well, have a good weekend, everyone.